So uh, my uh, assignment here today is to tell you about uh, theory that Rob Boyd and I developed uh, uh, about how the, the fundamental pro-social nature of humans, our ability to organize cooperation amongst non-relatives uh, came about. We're very unusual as a species in, in do, being able to do this. So uh, <coughs> humans do form uh, uh, large social groups. I'm going to talk about uh, tribes being the, uh, the uh, fundamental unit uh, under which uh, human uh, cooperation evolved. And of course, uh, most tribes are quite small units. The hunter-gatherer tribes are thinking of are on the order of hundreds to a few thousand uh, people. The biggest tribe I know of is the, is the, uh, <coughs> uh, is the uh, Turkana of, of northern Kenya where that have something like four or five hundred thousand people organized by an acephal acephalous tribal mechanism. So they can get pretty big, but they don't get anywhere near as big as, as modern societies. And so the transition, of course, is very important. So uh, the, the essential claim here is that cultural, uh, the fundamental claim that, that this uh, theory rests on is that cultural evolution contain, can uh, maintain much more variation between groups than can genes. And hence, uh, cultural group selection has been an important process in human evolution. And uh, that uh, tr uh, uh, cultural norms and institutions favoring cooperation evolve uh, in the first instance through group selection on uh, tribal scale uh, cultural uh, variation. Uh, and then there's a coevolutionary element to it that uh, uh, given primitive institutions uh, that uh, evolved in the middle of the Pleistocene, say we don't really know when this uh, uh, happened, uh, 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 imposed itself on genes. So primitive social norms would then act as social selection mechanisms. Individuals who couldn't conform to those norms, say because they were too belligerent, uh, uh, would be selected against. They'd be discriminated against in the marriage pool. They might be uh, even killed by their compatriots because they were just too mean to have around. And that this would uh, select out genes for too much belligerence. And in the end, it would uh, favor a a suite of pro-social attitudes and, and really emotions, I think, are the most important thing uh, in, uh, in, in, in human minds that uh, then uh, became very important in being able to cooperate on a large scale. And so emotions like sympathy and patriotism, loyalty to groups, sympathy with the uh, members of your fellow group. And also a psychology adapted to, uh, to learn social norms. Human uh, infants turn out to be really good at, at, at learning social norms uh, from their parents and caregivers. And, and they become little, uh, uh, little Nazis, you know, uh, uh, little rule enforcers. They get, they get enthusiastic about uh, uh, pointing out even to their parents uh, how they're wrong sometimes. And there's a, a, a strong tendency to identify with groups uh, that, uh, that we belong to uh, groups and, and we have an emotional commitment to those groups. This is the patriotism angle. And that the further uh, evolution of uh, uh, this set of uh, pro-social norms got established and it, Darwin called it primordial times. I mean, he was vague about the times uh, and he, these things fossilized poorly. We don't really dig them up in the, in the stones and bones record. So it's, we're still pretty vague about when uh, this all uh, happened. But once those kinds of uh, pro-social instincts uh, 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 were established in, in humans and they acted as uh, when we make choices about, uh, about the kinds of institutions that we're going to adopt, when we have alternative institutions on offer, alternative ideas about how we should behave, people will tend to prefer ones that uh, uh, favor cooperation in the groups that uh, uh, we live in. And so the, our ch the choices that we make uh, the inventions that we propose. Uh, political entrepreneurs propose things, and political entrepreneurs, no matter how selfish they are, they always cast the argument in the, in an argument, they cast the argument as a pro-social one, right? This is gonna help people. Now, it may help, they, they don't say, I'm, this is gonna make me filthy rich. Uh, anybody who said that would uh, not uh, get very many votes in the legislature. It has to be concealed, at least, behind a uh, pro-social argument. And so, on average, uh, maybe the reasons is societies have gotten larger and more complex and more cooperative over the uh, recent human history is owes to that. And the argument that I'm not going to have time to really get into, but I get into in, in, in an essay that was circulated at least to the students, is that, that modern organizations, uh, businesses and other organizations, bear a strong stamp of these, uh, uh, of the tribal origins, of uh, evolutionary origins. 
So uh, just a little uh, primer about cultural evolution. What is cultural evolution all about? At least in the way that, that Rob Boyd and I and a bunch of our colleagues now <coughs> think of it. Uh, culture is a form of inheritance. It's something like uh, uh, genes. We get it from somebody else. Uh, it, it differs in de greatly in detail from genes. So it includes the feature of the inheritance of acquired variation. You can have more than two parents. Uh, the, uh, we have a longer laundry list of of differences, but the important similarity is that, that it is a form of inheritance and it evolves in a Darwinian fashion by descent with modification. Uh, uh, we don't normally invent whole cultures all at once. They evolve over a, uh, a longish uh, period of time. We don't invent uh, uh, railroad trains uh, in one fell swoop. They uh, evolve uh, uh, by one incremental in innovation after another. And so we think of uh, cultural evolution as being uh, subjected to what I call a shifting concatenation of forces. There are a number of forces that bear on any particular uh, cultural variants that are floating around at any particular time in a particular culture. Uh, there's random variation, the idiosyncrasies of organization founders. Many businesses seem to bear, at least for a long time, the stamp of their founding entrepreneur. Uh, so we get uh, uh, sort of mutation-like uh, effects. Uh, uh, guided variation is what we call uh, learning from personal experience. So, so people learn and then they can teach what they learn to other people. The whole academic enterprise would be worthless if this wasn't true, right? Uh, if we don't learn something and teach it to other people, we aren't uh, earning our pay. Uh, and then there's what uh, Rob and I call bias transmission. People are relatively smart, uh, uh, selective shoppers in the marketplace of ideas. Uh, we uh, make some kinds of emotional and even rational considerations about about what we're going to adopt. And we use a bunch of different rules that, that we've uh, um, made theoretical uh, models about. There are lots of kinds of decision rules. And then there is uh, natural selection. Uh, uh, any kind of heritable <coughs> variation that sticks its head up in the world and has any important impact on behavior or uh, the success of individuals will be subject to natural selection. So, you know, bad habits will get you killed. Uh, dry, drinking and driving is uh, 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 kept to a low roar in part by natural selection, right? The young fellows who go out and, and if there's any genes or cultural uh, uh, determinants of uh, drinking and driving, uh, natural selection is playing a role in keeping it under control. Uh, uh, tribes with weak institutions learn fights, uh, lose fights, and often get absorbed by victorious tribes. Empires grow by, uh, by accreting uh, uh, weak uh, tribes, so the, the Roman Empire, the uh, expansion of the Chinese Empire, uh, uh, depended a lot on incorporating uh, uh, smaller scale societies with weaker institutions. Poorly run companies go uh, uh, bankrupt and, and uh, long surviving institutions school their employees in successful practices. So the Silicon Valley, a few Silicon Valley firms, uh, what is it, Fairchild Semiconductor is a, is a famous one that it, that it never got very big. Uh, but it was a serial producer of, of Silicon Valley entrepreneurs. It, it taught, got, uh, taught these engineers how to uh, uh, formulate new products, spin off companies, and uh, get rich and, and repeat the process. And so it, uh, it, a few companies like that uh, play a legendary role in the Silicon Valley uh, phenomenon. Uh, so let, uh, let's just take a quick look at the natural history of social, uh, human social systems. How, how did these things evolve. What, what are the differences between hu uh, human social systems and the social systems of our uh, closest living relatives? There's Kanzi, the, the uh, language learning chimpanzee, and, and Sue Savage Rumbaugh here. Uh, I guess you can't see. She's got had one of her fingers bitten off by one of her chimpanzees. Uh, uh, so uh, humans, by contrast to chimpanzees, are, are docile. We have extensive cooperation amongst distantly related individuals. You can gather a whole bunch of us here, strangers in this room, uh, most of us strangers. Some of us have met one another before, lots of, of strangers. If we were chimpanzees and we could suddenly get a bunch of chimpanzees like this in this room and with uh, maybe with tranquilizers and bags over their heads and, and then we could uh, at some point we lift the bags off after the tranquilizers are uh, worn off and they look around. There aren't enough women in this room, but I tell this joke to uh, my classes where there was about half or more women. And, and uh, sexually available women, strange guys. This would be a social nuclear explosion. The walls would <laughs> fold out. Uh, all hell would break loose. Uh, uh, we live in, uh, by comparison with chimpanzees, uh, in large, uh, very large groups. 
Oh, but these are imperfect and conflict-ridden groups. So you, we have to account for the fact that humans aren't, uh, aren't colonies of saints. Uh, I imagine even colonies of saints are get perfect and conflict-ridden, but that's another story. And, and so we use norms and institutions to control social life. We have social rules that, that we more or less uh, uh, internalize and use to regulate our social uh, behavior. So uh, ch uh, chimpanzees have been raised by uh, hand. Uh, th this is a tragic case from California a few years ago. Uh, this uh, uh, a chimpanzee mole was a, uh, a pet. Uh, that a couple tried to raise, and after he got to be a couple of years old, they had to give him to this uh, this uh, uh, chimp sanctuary. And uh, well, uh, they bring, brought Mo a birthday cake, and and so other chimpanzees got out and chasing a uh, a female, and and there was a uh, a huge. Uh, uh, well, the guy was killed. Uh, the chimpanzees mauled him to death. That's. Different. So uh, biologically, this is what uh, that all uh, boils down to. This is a chimpanzee brain. This is a chimpanzee testicle, test, uh, dissected from the same. <laughs> uh, so that's what we accomplished. Uh, uh, think of uh, think of teenage boys being. Uh, I tried to get it. If anybody has knows a pathologist who can supply me with the equivalent picture with actual human brain. And testes, I'll, uh, I'd love to have it. But this is the best I can come up with on Google Images. Uh, so Darwin uh, uh, started this line of uh, investigation, and, and you, most of you probably know this quote. So he thought that the uh, pro-social emotions like uh, patriotism, fidelity, obedience, courage, and sympathy were uh, people who were always willing to aid one another, sacrifice them for the common good, would be victorious over most other tribes. A tribe rich in those virtues would defeat other uh, tribes. And so the uh, Rob's and my social instincts hypothesis it, uh, <coughs> involves gene culture coevolution. I think I've gone through the basics of it already. So we, we have these ancient social uh, instincts and selfishness, struggles for dominance, nepotistic cooperation that, that break out all the time. They're part of the imperfections of human societies. Uh, we have these tribal social instincts that evolved by, uh, not by cultural group selection, we don't think, but by genetic group selection, not by genetic group selection, by cultural group selection, <coughs> the formation of symbolic boundaries. And then this creates uh, what, what uh, we've taken to calling the moral hidden hand. Uh, uh, so this is this idea that, that people with pro-social emotions, all else equal, will tend to favor institutions, laws, regulations, and behavior that that uh, that support uh, uh, group goals, the, the groups, of, the goals of the groups of the, that they are attached to, and favor group functional uh, norms and institutions, and <clears throat> includes an element of altruistic altruism and altruistic punishment that act as social selection mechanisms that that damp down the genetic, uh, 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 damp down individuals who have genes for too much of, of that, psychopaths and and so on. So there, we have a, a, a long and complicated theory. This would take uh, quite a while to go through just to point out that you can find on, on, the, uh, on my website and, and in our books a, a, a long scholarly defense of these ideas that I'm just breezing uh, through. One a, a quick check on this. This is a paper one of my students uh, wrote a couple, three years ago. And this shows the genetic variation between neighboring groups measured by FSD, the proportion of variation that's between group versus within groups, for, uh, this is neighboring human populations from Cavalli, Swartz, and Feldman's survey, and this is from the World Value Survey, the uh, distribution of cultural differences between groups as measured by uh, attitude survey differences. And so you can see that there's more than an order of magnitude difference. There isn't very much genetic variation between neighboring uh, groups by comparison with the amount of cultural variation between those same groups. And so uh, this is just an empirical argument that uh, it's much more plausible that, uh, much that, that cultural group selection is more important than genetic group selection. Uh, skip one slide, thank you. <laughs>